uh, I'll start kind of down here at the bottom, my life before Bear. Uh, and as Laura mentioned, uh, it truly started um, after my graduation, uh, my PhD from Colorado State was with, um, was with uh, Washington University Medical School. So I, my, my degree was in evolutionary biology and ecology. And um, it was a difficult time to try to find uh, roles, uh, postdoc roles or, or uh, roles in academia. And so I decided I might retool myself a bit and try my hand at medical research. And so landed a, a postdoc uh, with Jim Chevrud in the medical school for about three years. And it was really fascinating to me. Um, a lot of the same tools and questions we were asking in agriculture uh, really did pertain to the work we were doing in, in, in his laboratory, which was to find map genomes and then link those uh, genotypes to phenotypes for human ailments. So we were looking at things like glaucoma, uh, diabetes, um, several different diseases by, by using mice as a, as a model and then fine mapping those. Um, oddly enough, we're still getting papers out of the, jet, the data that we generated uh, from back in the, the late 1990s. Uh, it's been quite a body of, of research and, and data that people are now using in different ways. Uh, the modeling that we had available back then was very different and not nearly as sophisticated. So it was a great repository of data. My time at WashU was fantastic. Uh, I did teach evolutionary biology and ecology while I was there uh, as a postdoc. Um, and live in St. Louis now, so I should have mentioned that. I'm in, I'm in St. Louis, and Washington University is uh, about a half a mile away from my front door. Um, so at the end of my postdoc, I uh, looked around and decided industry might be a different direction for me again, and my background growing up was in agriculture, and Monsanto was in town, and so I started in 1999 in a, uh, uh, a role that was uh, early research and discovery, looking for different ways to control insect pests in agricultural crops. Um, spent about 10 years in R&D, uh, became project lead of various crops. And oddly enough, some of that research and discovery that we did and the patents that we acquired then are just now becoming deregulated and in the hands of growers this year. Uh, so this year was kind of a, kind of a, a full circle for me. Um, some of the work I did back in 2005 to uh, identify new techniques uh, to control insects are now coming to uh, the commercial areas in, uh, in agriculture. Um, I had various different roles uh, over, those, uh, over those decades. Um, I, the, the one role that was really interesting to me because I got to travel a lot and meet a lot of different people and regions was uh, the cotton and specialty crops role. So what we were doing there, what I was doing was trying to um, create new business models in different areas of the world using the technologies that we were developing in, in agriculture, primarily biotech, but also uh, hybrid seed production. Um, so I got to travel a lot. It uh, you know, took me all over the world. Um, probably the most, the most interesting places were in, in Asia. I uh, got to spend time in Pakistan, in India, um, also in Latin America, uh, just getting to meet with other scientists, getting to meet with regulators and farmers. Um, and so really understanding how the, the work that we did would translate then to um, farmers anywhere in the world of any size. Um, so then over the next couple of years, I, I moved into more commercial roles. And then about six and a half years ago into regulatory. And uh, it's a difficult space to describe. Uh, it's, it's been uh, one of the more rewarding roles I've had. Uh, so like I, like I mentioned, everything we do is in a regulated environment. Um, we develop biotech traits in different crops. We, we discover new synthetic chemistries for crop protection. We're involved in, in microbial research and design for my, microbes that can control uh, various pests of, of crops. And now being with Bayer, we also have two other divisions in, in the life science group, uh, pharma, which probably more people are familiar with. Uh, bear aspirin is, is kind of widely recognized. Uh, and so in the pharma uh, areas, we can now collaborate a little bit more extensively uh, in the R&D space. And then we also have a consumer health group, and I can share some of that with you in a little bit as well. So that's kind of the, the brief run through. Like I said, I got my PhD at Colorado State, and my master's was at... Uh, Ohio State. Um, and so um, 
yeah, it's been uh, 20 years of getting back to agriculture, but using new technologies and discovering new technologies that hadn't really been thought of uh, in the past. Um, the other thing we do sometimes to get to know one another is just talk about the extras. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really passionate around developing our teams. I had to integrate a legacy bear team in regulatory with a legacy Monsanto team. And so we're an organization now of about 1500 people uh, roughly divided between the two legacy organizations. Um, and really the work that we do is um, early, early data collection on the products to ensure that they're safe uh, for both human and animal as, as well as for the environment. Um, the other thing I, I spend a lot of time doing is looking at the intersection of innovation and socioeconomic political intersections. Uh, it's become very interesting to see how, how technologies and innovation have become levers in, in, many, in many socioeconomic conversations with governments. And so I've gotten to spend time with uh, uh, different ministries around the world, trying to help them understand what we do, uh, why the data that we're collecting and submitting to them for review is, is um, to, to, to show the safety of the products. Um, and then leisure time, uh, I, I've really gotten into cooking, especially the past year of being in, uh, being in a lockdown. I haven't, been, I haven't been back to my office in over a year. The picture behind me is a new building that we just moved into about a year before uh, the lockdown. So we've gotten, to, uh, we've gotten to inhabit it for a while, but we haven't, I haven't seen it now in over a year. Uh, spent a lot of time in Colorado. Uh, I do like things that move, uh, motorcycles and some cars. Uh, married and have a daughter who's graduating Butler University in Indiana. Uh, Indiana. Uh, she's got a business degree in international business, and then she decided that wasn't hard enough, so she's gotten a minor in law and Chinese, and now deciding what she wants to do uh, beyond her undergrad. So that's more about me. Um, we can we can take questions at any time. I don't mean to be rattling on with a presentation, but but I do have some background information on Bear. Uh, some of the things that we're doing in sustainability, I heard some of you mention that that's of interest, uh, and then what it's like to be in a life science company as a scientist, uh, and the different, the, different, uh, the different resources that are at your disposal um, at a company like Bear. So, what, yeah, why don't you give them a quick, uh, quick overview, I suspect what will become uh, very interesting, very quickly are the questions that will, will start mm -hmm. to come in, so. Yep. So like I mentioned, um, life science companies aren't new. Uh, the challenge with them is that um, they, they don't seem to last very long. Monsanto was actually a life science company 25 years ago. We had a pharma group. Uh, we had a crop science group. Um, and so by bringing together the different disciplines that, that those two business units um, require. Um, the idea is that you can leverage the, the different individuals, the skill sets into generating more value in both of those uh, areas. So at Bayer, uh, one of the biggest life science companies now, we have crop science where we're involved in chemical, biological, crop protection, like I mentioned, seed and trait, uh, also digital, and we're getting into more of the service technologies as, as agriculture is evolving pretty quickly uh, in these spaces. Uh, the biggest group is in the pharma group, pharmaceuticals. Um, we're really best known for the cardiology and women's healthcare. Uh, radiology is a big, a big business unit, especially in North America. Uh, and so um, with the work that goes on to discover new drugs, it's not someone like discovering new proteins or new synthetic chemistries for agriculture. So we're just beginning to tap into how can we leverage the scientists and the different processes that we have to go through in the regulatory space um, between, between those two functionally different groups, but, but by and large have a lot in common. And then we also have a, um, a consumer health group. So these are the non-prescription type things that you find over the counter. Uh, so uh, dermatology, uh, pain, like I mentioned, bare aspirin, a very long standing product uh, from Bear. Um, digestive health, cold, cough, allergies, lots of over-the-counter medications uh, in that space too. Um, copper tone uh, sunscreen used to be a product that Bayer had uh, and just recently divested that to another company. So that's sort of the business areas. 
And just to give you a, a bit of a sense of the size um, of the entire group, um, so Bear overall is about a 45 or sorry, $44 billion company, billion euros um, across all three of those business groups. In, in crop science, we're, we're roughly 17 billion of the 43. We have about 103,000 people globally, and I'll show you where we're primarily located in, in just a minute. In crop science, we're about uh, only 23 of thousand of these 103. So again, a lot of it goes into sales and, uh, and, and, and support staff uh, for an organization that size. Um, R&D investment, 5.3 billion, and about a billion of that is in crop science, and the rest of that's primarily in pharma. Uh, pharma studies, if you, uh, if you understand any of, of, of that area, very expensive, right? Um, large focus groups, and as we are seeing more of it become apparent to us during COVID-19, the vaccinations and what it takes to get uh, deregulated on, on vaccinations, we've, we've seen it go really fast uh, here in the past two years, but, but by and large, um, very expensive space to be in. And then we're in 87 different countries. And crop science is in 84 of those 87 countries. So uh, within crop science, we, we pretty much span the same footprint as our uh, pharma and consumer health colleagues. And we're everywhere. Um, if you think about 87 countries, uh, you know, we're, we're located primarily in North America and Europe, um, but we do kind of break it down into four regions. So North America, including Canada, uh, Mexico, United States, and then Latin America, which would include primarily Brazil, um, Argentina, but also all of the other uh, South American countries as well are in that cluster. And then Asia Pacific, um, probably our smallest region of the group, but the most diverse. So everywhere from, uh, from India through China, Australia, New Zealand, um, and all countries in between. Um, and then Middle East, uh, what we call it EMEA, Europe, Middle East, Africa. So that group then is where Bear headquarters uh, are for the company. Um, and also we're probably the biggest expenditure of the, of the R&D and, and of, the, uh, of the pharma group resides. And then when we think about why the company decided to invest in the acquisition of Monsanto, which was entirely an agricultural company, it really came down to this. I think um, this health for all, hunger for none uh, is something that uh, Bear had been looking at trying to solve for. This is what the vision is, what we, what we wanna become. Um, do we have the tools to actually do it? And um, with the pharma and consumer health, um, we can get there for part of it. And then with the hunger for none, that's where the crop science comes in. And so we're, we're kind of guided by the science first. So in all aspects, you gotta have the science. If the science doesn't tell you the story of what you're trying to do, whether it's um, prevent and, and cure disease or grow a crop without uh, heavier inputs or without pests, um, those are the kinds of things that we're aiming for. And to do that, we've made some, some pretty big commitments uh, just recently. So I didn't put them in this deck just because I wanted to make sure we had time for uh, discussion, but we made some commitments to um, improve the lives of 100 million smallholder farmers in crop protection. And so that means making sure that, that we're present where they are and that we're addressing the needs that they have. That could be through information, through digital uh, formats, uh, or it could be through registration of products that don't exist in those regions to, to solve problems. Uh, one of the biggest ones in the past two years has been the uh, uh, infestations of, it's, a, it's called a fall armyworm. It's primarily a uh, new world pest, but because of how uh, international trade has occurred, it's now found its way into, into, uh, into Asia. And so into Indonesia and, and Taiwan, uh, this pest has just ravaged corn production in those countries. And we have the solutions. They're registered in North America and South America, but not for cultivation in, in Asia. And so what we've done, and we just got some of the very first uh, registrations is to move that product and that corn uh, uh, tool into those countries to help growers in that region. And it'll make a very big difference um, for those. So, so this is sort of the high level of what we think of when we when we think of what we do at Bear and how does what our work do on a daily basis, how does it fit into the big picture? 
health for all and hunger for none. And then we can break it down into what our component of that accountability is. And then just a few more, and I won't, I won't spend much time here. We are a company that needs to make money. And so you can't, you can't deny that, but we're also a company that wants to be a, a responsible corporate partner with society. And so we do have to maximize shareholder value. That's the way that we get paid. People uh, invest in us in order for us to invest those billions of dollars in research. That's what we have to do. We also want to be this impact generator where we think about sustainability and how do you translate sustainability into business value so that it is, is sustainable. To be honest, uh, people can talk about sustainability, but if it's not really backed up by, by some kind of a revenue stream for someone, whether that's a grower, uh, someone intermittent in the channel, or from the producer of the technology, it doesn't really last very long. And then, and then we also want to be, you know, in this in this far right hand side, you know, create the financial stability for sustainability to make sense. A lot of our products are sustainable; they're not without controversy. Uh, chemistries and biotech, you can go anywhere in the world and you'll find uh, controversy over what we do in agriculture. Um, but we, we, aren't, we aren't turning a blind eye to organic farming. A lot of our products are used in organic farming, but it just isn't the only way that we're going to do what we need to do to, uh, to uh, feed a population for the future and bring innovation that, that society is going to need and, and has needed. I mean, agriculture from the time I started till now I couldn't have imagined 20 years looking like it does today from when I started 20 years ago. So many things have changed. And then um, we always tie it back to what we think of when, when you get to the um, you know, uh, sustainability commitments that uh, you know, are international. And so we tie everything we do into the 17 sustainable development goals and we try to figure out where our products have a fit. And then that gives us a, a, a position that we can begin to talk about with people that either don't understand what we do or, or and want to learn or people that really don't, don't know what we do and have, have a disagreement with it. We have a common place to start. If you can start here and we understand that these 17 sustainability goals mean something and our goal is to reach this blueprint by 2030, we have a place to, to play in this. And so whether it's pharma, consumer or crop science, we, we always look at uh, you know, what, what we do, does it fit with, with these high level goals? And then just real quick, um, uh, on crop science in particular, um, we're delivering innovation. We've really shifted into digital transformation. So this is, the, this is the space that has amazed me the most in agriculture. We've got seeds and traits and we've got crop protection. We've got now digital agriculture and we bought a company a few years ago called Climate Corp. And that is allowing growers to plant seeds and apply inputs when and where they're needed versus blanket applications across the entire field. So this is really feeding into our sustainability commitments and we've invested a lot in the digital transformation. The areas that we're involved in, uh, if it's in uh, chemical and biological crop protection, it's, it's all of the indications, uh, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and then seed growth, making plants healthier in seed and trait, um, primarily row crops, but we do have a, a big vegetable business. And then we're involved in horticulture when it comes to crop protection. Digital services are becoming more important to us. And then we have a whole group called environmental science that works on things like golf courses, uh, ornamentals, lawn care, things that uh, the average day consumers would, would be uh, seeing, uh, you know, and managing every day too. So the um, the real research and, and development areas are in small molecule discovery, understanding the plant and soil microbiomes, genome editing uh, was something that uh, you know, we're now really involved in as well as uh, RNA interference. So some of the work that we've done in crop protection um, is the same kind of idea that we're using in the COVID-19 vaccinations. So uh, if you've followed some of the science behind that, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, and then the precision breeding, so making sure that we can make crosses of germplasm lines that are better for nutrition or for taste and palatability to get uh, vegetables and, and fruits and vegetables into more of a consumer diet. So that's kind of a quick tour through, uh, through Bear. Uh, I'll stop sharing now if I can figure out how to do that. Um, stop share. Come back so I can see you guys again. There we go. 
So pretty much anything you want to ask, I'm open to uh, start any dialogue you want to begin. Um, it's been, uh, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed working with uh, the, the WashU team here uh, in the McDonald Scholar Program. Um, it's been a little over a year. I know we've had a few meetings now that have been uh, virtual and on Zoom. And so, uh, you know, we're all kind of adapting to this new format to, to see each other. Uh, but one day, one day, we'll, we'll get to see you guys presenting in person and hopefully I'll be uh, sitting there watching. So look forward to that day. <laughs> Hi, Ty. Uh, thanks for a great introduction. And uh, I was wondering because of how spread out and diverse the goals and um, kind of uh, different scientific um, endeavors of the company are. So how do you sort of, um, when you look for new, let's say scientists to join you um, and um, like, how do you, how do you go about that? Like what kind of things do you look into or do you look for something very specific or does it have to like, do the people you recruit always come from a very um, specialized region or do they, are, are you open to more broader scientists too? Mm -hmm. No, it's a great question. I would say that it's definitely changed over the years. Um, it used to be focused, I would say, at Monsanto and Bayer more on content expertise. Mm -hmm. Still some degree of that. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're going to uh, be working in an area in R&D and it's very specialized, whether that's in pharma, crop science, um, you do need to have the right skill set. Mm -hmm. We have hired people that are um, very specialized in genome editing, whether they uh, completed a, a, a PhD in that space or they did a postdoc. Um, having that understanding is, is, can be key for certain roles. But I would say more than anything now, especially when we think about hiring people into um, roles of leading people, I'm w much more interested in leadership skills and, than I am in the background. The background is gonna make a better leader. And if, if it's not something that has to be finite, that you need a, a specific chemistry or chemist for, then, then I look for the other soft skills because what makes a team great is the person that is helping develop that team keeping them energized, always looking ahead, trying to find new technologies to solve a problem and being ahead in the game. And that comes from good leaders and making people feel like they want to work at the job every day. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I asked that because um, you must know from being uh, in a PhD in evolutionary biology yourself, how different the whole and vast the field can be. So for example, I am in an ecology and evolutionary program and many things I do overlap with some of my um, colleagues who work directly with plants, but I personally directly don't work with plants. I work with microbes. So that's that's why I ask like when you look for a potential, um, somebody joining as a scientist, what are the kind of things that you look for? Yeah. I would say the probably the most important thing when you get to that point, whether you're looking in academia or in industry or with government, mm -hmm. um, being able to position what you know and demonstrate the breadth and depth of the topic area, but also let your own, your own personal passion show through. And, and that is probably the most important thing. The rest of it, a lot of it you have to learn on the job. I mean, there's probably nobody who, like myself, I'll just use as an example, I came into the role because of my work in evolutionary biology and what I was doing was to understand how we find new things to solve resistance issues, right? Mm -hmm. And so it tied in, but I'm not doing anything related to that. I haven't been doing anything related to that for many years now. Uh, and so once you, once you know that you have a good fit into a company's culture, it's much easier to navigate where you want to take your career. Uh, that's great, thanks. I'll ask one last question before I eat up everybody else's time. Um, but another thing, and this is something I saw on the website, and I don't know if you directly touched on it, but what are some of the aspects on biodiversity that you guys are working on? Um, which I am assuming is a bit different from sustainability per se. So um, yeah, so just any research or um, innovations in biodiversity. I'd love to hear them. 
Yeah, and we have an entire group that works on biodiversity. They're not really within the sustainability organization. Um, a lot of the things that we do and the ways that we launch products, we have to ensure that that biodiversity is not negatively impacted, right? And that's that's counterintuitive when people think about spraying chemistries in fields. Uh, clearly, you know, if it's a uh, non-discretionary, you're going to have an impact on a lot of different things. So what we're trying to do, it's multifaceted, but we're trying to develop new products that are very specific to a given pest that won't affect other beneficial insects, especially pollinators or endangered species. Um, and where we do have that overlap and you just can't get away from it. I mean, monocultures in general mm -hmm. are going to have impact in biodiversity. We look for places and we've designed uh, tools that growers can use to designate areas of biodiversity on their farm that would be low productivity. And so sometimes they continue to put inputs on low productivity land and they really don't gain anything. And you'd be much better off if you put that into natural habitat, increase biodiversity, augmented pollinators, and, and try to find a way to give credit back to growers that do that. So there are some government programs in some countries that, that growers can apply to and they can get paid to set aside areas of their, of their production for biodiversity. So there's a lot of different ways from innovation to the way that the products are launched and used and stewarded in, in the environment. But yeah, we, we spend a lot of time under, understanding the systems and the products that we use on biodiversity. Thank you. Hello, Ty. Hi, Rafael. Um, nice um, suggestions and um, presentation. And, um, I am a non scientist. And so, uh, for the sake of the couple of um, business school people on here, um, I am curious to find the role of non technical professionals on teams in uh, Bayer. You, I think, have led a lot of projects. Um, how typical is it to find a non technical? No professional on a team and typically what skill sets do they bring on board to ensure um, successful project executions? Yeah, great question. And um, you know, I don't know exactly the breakdown of scientists versus the non-scientific skill sets, but um, it's, it's, not, it, it's not biased. If anything, it's probably biased against the, uh, the specific sciences. We have a lot of people with business degrees um, they find themselves in, in various roles. Uh, we've got uh, people that have business degrees in corporate strategy. So these are folks that find new business areas to work in. Uh, I, I was you know, paired up with some of these folks when I was doing the work in Pakistan and India to, to do business development. And so they understand um, you know, how, how, how we can make money at what we do, but then also how that value is shared between the grower and the other, uh, other entities in the channel, right? So we don't go directly to a grower, we go to retail. Retail goes to grower. And then we have agencies around the world that support that. So we have a lot of business degree majors. We have a lot of business consultants that we hire practically permanently within the company uh, to help us with uh, understanding the business values that we might not see on our own. Uh, scientists typically aren't the best judge of business value. We're gonna follow the, we're going to follow the hypothesis and the innovation because we're curious and that may not be the best thing to be following all the time so there are a lot of people that help guide that uh, it's different than in academia at least maybe you know 10 20 years ago where you could follow your question and not have to worry so much about where it fit now i know that's changed a bit right there, there are grants that are competitive and and you have to be able to find a fit for the work that you do um, we don't have that latitude but we do have a lot of investment into people in marketing, sales, business degrees, and strategy that help guide the process along the way. I actually have an entire team. Some of them are technical, but the rest of them are more focused on sort of the uh, social political aspects. So there's a lot of poli sci uh, majors in the group. Um, they're the ones that are really watching policy develop around the world and making sure that, that we can either keep up with the policy development or provide input to influence that policy development for the greater good of agriculture or pharma, right? There's a lot of places within a company, a life science company that you'd find roles like that. Okay, um, hi, Ty. Um, thanks for your presentation. 
Um, can you hear me clearly? Yep. Okay. So uh, my question is twofold. Like, with regards to the controversies you mentioned earlier, so I, I've always heard about Monsanto, and I know that there were a lot of controversies about it. So acquiring Monsanto, like Bayer acquiring Monsanto, like, was there any negative aspects that came up associated with that? Like, did it affect maybe your company profile or revenue generation in any way? Then also, um, like, there's an increasing need for, like, organic products. People are saying organic, organic. Does this affect your company's mission as well? And all these um, policies that are going on, regulations, um, does it, like, make it restrictive or do you find it supportive? And how do you, like, manage this in order to reach your um, objectives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of loaded questions there, Judith. Uh, so yeah, Monsanto, uh, you know, was a target for many years and it has a long history, a hundred year old company that was involved in a lot of different businesses. Um, the first pioneer in biotech and GMOs, right? So you don't have to look too far to find non-GMO products and, and free from products, but, you know, the science speaks for itself. And um, we didn't do ourselves any favor in those early years. We just thought that we had invented this great technology it had all of these benefits, therefore people will want to be in, in, in adopt it. Couldn't have been more wrong, right? Europe uh, still to this day doesn't adopt GMO. They'll import the food or feed, but they won't cultivate it in Europe. Um, we're starting to see that change a little bit with genome editing. There's actually a pretty, a pretty big push now from some of the member states that wanna see genome editing actually adopted um, in Europe and not go by the wayside like biotech did, um, but it, it'll take some time. And it's gotta be, uh, you know, it, it takes as much outreach as, as, you, as you can do to, to, to try to deal with the negative connotation. And the Monsanto name obviously didn't help that. All of the stories, and if you Google Monsanto, you know, the top 20 are gonna be all negative stories. But I can tell you from 21 years, I wouldn't have worked for a company if I believed any of that. Uh, wouldn't have fit my own my own characteristics of what I wanted to do, um, but we just didn't have the ability to really change that that perception. We tried, and and it was really about being really really crisp on the science. And um, you know, I'm sure I'm sure everyone's probably at least caught uh, some news article about glyphosate, and and that was that was another one of these right a molecule that has been proven safe for almost 50 years, and yet. Um, one, one, uh, one group of, of scientists can, can cause a lot of problems like this and we have to deal with it. So um, two sides to every story. We just don't ever do a good job of telling our side of the story. Um, in terms of the regulations being an advantage or disadvantage, I think you know, it sounds contrary, but if we didn't have regulations in, in dispute, it would be harder to get these technologies approved or, or accepted. Um, we have to get them approved. Uh, we, don't, we don't choose to be in a regulated environment. We have to work in a regulated environment. Of, of the things that we do, even organic uh, is, is, is a regulated environment. There are things you can and can't use in organic production. Some of those things are just as toxic as a synthetic chemistry would be. Um, so they still have regulations. So all, all kinds of farming from large scale to small scale organic, um, all of those things are trying to bring the whole of agriculture into a different place. Um, and it's the new technologies, if we don't see them adopted, will become stagnant and, and food security will become an issue. We know that's true. It's already occurring all around the world. Um, so we spend a lot of time working in Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment, trying to bring in non-biotech, but bring in new, new hybrids and new varieties of crops that will be able to resist some of the pressures from the environment and sustain some of the pressure from, from pest and disease, um, but are far superior than what is currently used in open pollinated varieties and things of that nature. So um, I think I answered all three of those questions, but if I missed anything, let me know. Uh, regulations to me are exciting. I mean, that's kind of what kept, keeps, me, uh, keeps me up at night, but it also um, is exciting because you have to find new ways of, of convincing people to see the data for what it is um, and, and show the benefits. We live in a, a risk-based environment, right? There are always going to be risks with anything we do. Driving your car in the morning is a risk, but we choose to do it because there's a benefit to it. 
um, planting and using crop inputs is a risk, but there's clearly a benefit to doing it as long as it's safe. Thank you. I, I, uh, thanks for giving the brief description of what is going on in Bear. So I had a question regarding your experience transitioning from uh, as a PhD student and then postdoc to industry. So what advice would you have for someone who is transitioning as a PhD student and is new to industry? Yeah, and um, again, I, my experiences are probably a bit dated, so I can probably share with you what we're doing as an industry to attract uh, uh, postgraduates and, and um, postdocs. So we have a program called Emerging Leaders in Science. Um, what we do is we have specific areas within R&D and we know we need specific talent, um, both leadership as well as expertise. And so we, 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 have, we solicit input from universities and we work with universities around the world um, for good candidates that are either postdocs or ideally have spent some time as a postdoc. There's a lot that you learn in that, that capacity. Um, not so much the tedious writing of grants, but um, just the, the experimentation and the influence of, of what you have to do. And so we have this program called Emerging Leaders in Science. We bring the, those, those postdoc candidates in and we rotate them through the company into three or four different positions. Um, so they get a really broad experience really fast. They learn about the culture, they learn about their own leadership challenges and strengths, and then we can develop them even faster for work in a corporate environment. So those are those programs I would I would I would suggest might be a benefit to look at when you're at that stage and ready to, to do that. There's also just the, the common app, you know, uh, postings are made at society meetings online and, and applications. Those, those seem a little bit more uh, like cold calling because you don't really have a face or a name that you can associate with it versus, versus the recruiting, right? And so networking is, uh, can't be understated. Um, it was my, my network that led me to uh, uh, Wash U Medical School um, because I had gone to evolutionary society meetings and I had met people and the work that Jim was doing uh, fit with what I was doing just in a completely different space. But I was able to translate what I was doing to convince him to give me a shot in, in his laboratory. So selling yourself is something that's really important too. Um, you can always talk, you'll talk anybody under the table with what you know about the work that you're in. What's harder is how do you translate to what they don't know and how can you get them excited about what you bring uh, to, the, to the role? Thank you. Yeah, just to piggyback on uh, Sukran's question. So what are some of the challenges that you faced when you were transitioning um, from academia to industry and um, how did you bridge those gaps? Yeah, it, um, Again, it, 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 it's so different. It's, it's really hard to explain it. Um, you spend a lot of time in academia, whether it's a, a, your PhD program or a postdoc, um, doing the things that are going to get you publications, grants, um, those sorts of things. are the, That's the ultimate goal. None of that is as important in industry. What's the most important is industry is kind of freeing your mind from, from what you know and trying to find answers to the questions that you don't know. And what we did in the patents that, that I've you know, been able to uh, be part of were because we, we really pushed the boundaries of what the science was telling us. One of them, like I mentioned, was in uh, RNA. So someone had gone to a society meeting and, and they were talking about using RNA interference in a different uh, uh, application. And they came back and gave a, a, a download of what they learned and it was immediate. They're like, could we use that in insect control? We had no idea. We knew the fire and mellow patents. We knew what they had done. Um, it was a brand new area back then, 15 years ago. And we started working on it. And within 18 months, we had a product concept. So it's that kind of thing. I mean, if you're inquisitive, mm -hmm. it's going to be easy, right? It's going to be very easy to transition. The harder part is all of the other corporate stuff that comes with it all of the policies and, and uh, trainings and because you, you know, there, there are just more restrictions on corporations that people have to follow, antitrust, uh, 
uh, issues, right? You can't you can't take money from people uh, uh, to do to do things unless it's all transparent. You can't have somebody publish something and put your name on it. Those are the kinds of things that you probably would never even think of, but exist in a corporate world. Hello, Ty. Thank you for your presentation. As a follow-up question to the switch, what's usually motivates the switch from the academia to the corporate? Everyone's going to be a little different. Um, mine was I was a little bit geographically tied to the St. Louis area. Uh, my my wife had just gotten a, a role here in St. Louis with Anheuser Busch at the time, and so um, I had a radius of where I could look. And academia just wasn't. It, it, I, I, I was ready to do another NSF postdoc at WashU. Um, that was that was something, or NIH at that time, I guess. Uh, and that was something I was ready to do. But then somebody reached out and said, you know, we've got this role open at Monsanto. Are, would you be interested? And then at first I said, hell no, I, I don't want to. I don't want to go to uh, corporate America. I want to stay in academia. But I went ahead, um, talked to some folks, did the interview, and was pretty excited by the time I was done with it. Um, but everyone's going to be a little different. Uh, I, I firmly believe we need people to remain in academia. A lot of the science that we, that we trust and need comes from scientists and academia, but I, I'm becoming a little worried. Um, I think I've you know, talked to groups of students in the past and more and more I see that fewer of them want to stay in academia for lots of different reasons. It's harder, there's less money, it's, uh, it, it becomes more competitive. Um, and so it's just, it's a difficult situation. So I think what, um, I think what this scholars program is doing, it's preparing people for different opportunities, whether that's corporate America or NGOs or government or academia, that's a personal choice at the end of the day, but networking again, to really understand what those options look like and talking to people is the best way to figure out what's going to be right for you. Sure. Thank you. Um, hi, Ty, thank you for doing this. And I have a small question as a law student. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the legal department at Bayer. Um, and I'm wondering yeah. what they do in daily life because you mentioned lots of policies and regulation. I guess um, some of this are related to law. Uh, very much so, yes. Um, so there are, there's, what kind of laws can I, so I think there's four or six permanent lawyers on my team now. And we have a bunch of assist, uh, paralegals as well. So anything from IP, so we have to protect our intellectual property. And so IP filings require legal uh, uh, purview. And then a lot of times we're involved in lawsuits too. And so we need to make sure that um, what we do is, is um, approved through the legal strategies. Um, and then when we do get into lawsuits that we have legal defense of, of what we do and the products that we sell. So, uh, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, um, legal becomes a very big part in all of these industries. Any corporation is gonna have a, uh, a pretty heavy presence of law students. I'm having the exact same conversation with my daughter. She wants to go to law school, but not quite sure where she wants to go or what she wants to do, what kind of law to practice. Uh, so she's trying to figure that out right now too, but. Um, there are internship programs at most companies that uh, will bring in lawyers or law students as interns to see if it's the right fit and then um, determine whether or not that's, if it is, then we typically hire them in. But we have a very big law department. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to just interject for a quick moment because um, we've sort of run into the one o'clock hour. I know some people might have classes, so if you need to leave, just you know, go ahead. That's not that's not a big deal. Um, but as long as Ty is willing to stay on for a few more minutes, I'm sure we could handle a, a couple more questions if there's still any out there. Yeah, I'm good until a quarter after. Then I do need to jump to another call. But um, fine for another ten minutes or so. Hey, uh, Ty. Uh, one more question that I have is, uh, as you speak about internships, so is that only directed towards um, law or business students, or do you also, the company also holds small time, uh, like facilities for scientists? 
We do. Um, we do bring in, uh, I guess, at two levels. We we can do internships during the uh, during either the master's or PhD program. So we do have a few of our scientists that will either sit on committees or sponsor students. Um, so we, you know, that's not a it's not a big uh, it's not a big group of people, but we do it. Um, we also bring in internships for the summer, things like that. The problem is long-term internships become problematic because a lot of what we do is um, protected and it can't be published until we file for the IP. And so that means that the work that you might do, you can't use towards a publication, which then disservices you for the time you spent because those publications count then for your ability to get jobs and awards and, and credit, right? So, so we're very careful with bringing in, bringing in uh, graduate students unless we have a project that can absolutely be that, that individual's project and they can own it and publish it um, so that we don't do a disservice as just hiring somebody for uh, you know, a pair of hands to do research. That's just not, that's not, that's not conducive to either party at the end of the day. So, but there are internships. It's just in the law space and in, uh, in more of the commercial space, it's, you don't have that same constraint. Okay, thanks. So maybe I'll ask you a quick question then before we, uh, uh, how has this virtual environment um, affected you either positively or, or negatively? Has it, has it been an impedance to, um, to your careers at this point or is it something that you found new ways of connecting and, uh, and learned, learned more about yourself and more about others? Anybody wanna take a stab? As, as a, as somebody who is who works in the lab, I think in that case, in that sense, it has slowed down my uh, work and progress in the sense because uh, suddenly there are um, like labs shut down or the security levels go from like one level to the other, and those things sometimes happen very quickly, and then um, you don't get enough time to prepare for that. So in that way, it has been a bit um, um, sort of slow and impeding, but at the same time, it has also been really great because now you get to go to conferences in Europe from your bedroom and uh, you, there are like, we get to connect with people like you th through this and, uh, and it takes much less, um, like effort and uh, sort of, um, there are many more resources which previously would have prevented me from doing such things. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it has also opened up many different kinds of avenues, uh, but it has slowed down my degree. So that's there. <laughs> I for one miss miss people. Yeah, <laughs> I think I I think I've said this uh, before. And the idea that um, we're just left with the work, right? What used to used to have some camaraderie that would exist in your office, or you'd have a variety of people that you would have the chance of seeing across a specific day. Now it's just you and your email and and the work, you know. So I think the relationship development is much harder um, at this point, even though we do have access in a lot of ways to people in a different uh, in a different way. So, but I, I think there's nothing uh, better than having that face to face meeting to really you know check in with somebody and see how they're doing. Yeah. Also, food for uh, at seminars and meetings. <laughs> right. You don't get that anymore. Right, you guys have had to fend for yourself. Yeah, you just had to cook for a meeting. That's just sad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I know you have to uh, roll on to your next next uh, meeting. I'm sure everyone else has has other places to go as well. I just wanted to thank you so much. For doing this, uh, these experiences really help our scholars uh, really get a look at what what is life like past my degree. You know what what are different pathways to success and and 
because you have both of those that both that corporate and that um, academic uh, perspective, I think is really useful for this group. So we are very grateful for you uh, joining us today, uh, sharing, you know, about Bayer and also uh, a little bit about what, you know, what's been interesting across across your career. So I, I thank you for that. Laura, I have one last one. Well, well, Raphael, you have one more question. <laughs> no, 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 it's not really a question. But will Ty be open to um, further interaction beyond this? You know, we are time bound and the contents that he had to cover also are kind of limited. So we'll... Yes. So you want to know, can I share, can I share contact information? I was going to say, Laura, if you want, you maybe you can email my uh, email and uh, contact information to the team. Yeah. I can be great. Yeah. 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 I would love to connect with you guys again, officially in a lunch meeting like this or whatever. So uh, more than happy to. It sounds looks like several of you are at least in St. Louis. So uh, the time zone is a little easier, but uh, I've got people around the world. So no no problem there if we need to connect on a evening call too. So. Thanks a lot for doing this. It was pretty informative. Um, yeah, and I've already sent you a LinkedIn request. So I'll see. <laughs> I did the same thing this morning. Yeah, that. Laura's this morning. Yeah, <laughs> I was surprised we weren't already linked in. I, that's that was actually my surprise. I was like, wait a minute, I'm not already connected. This is yeah. <laughs> no, it was great, guys. Thanks again for, uh, for all the great questions and engagement. So appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Thanks.